My name is Peter, and I help direct the events here at Strand. Uh, for a little bit of history, Strand was founded in 1927 by the Bass family over on what was then 4th Avenue's Book Row. Stretching from Union Square to Astor Place, Book Row gradually dwindled until after over 92 years, Strand is the sole survivor, still run by the Bass family, still housing new and used books, and still putting on over 400 events like this one a year. Uh, but it's a special night because we are very excited to welcome Paul Rosalie, naturalist, author, and award-winning wildlife filmmaker, to discuss his brand new novel, The Girl and the Tiger, his first foray into fiction. It follows Mother of God, his first book, and his work writing and creating shows with Natural Geographic, National Geographic, I should say, and Netflix, and exploring the relationship between humans and nature and the vanishing wildnesses of the earth. Paul has also worked as a naturalist and activist to help protect over 6,000 acres of wildlife habitat in the Amazon and in India, where his first and second books are respectively set. The Girl and the Tiger builds on 10 years of field study in an India facing the Anthropocene with its vast declines in biodiversity and animal populations. Couldn't be more excited to have him with us, so without further ado, please join me in welcoming Paul Rosalie to the Strand. Hey everybody, thank you for coming. Am I loud enough right now? Okay, good. This is exciting. This is... For me and my sister, this is our favorite bookstore. We like, we're like, we like worship Strand, so it's cool to be here. Um, really, thank you guys for coming. I know a lot of you guys suffered through some traffic. Uh, I will dive right in. Usually, I'm talking about the Amazon, and that's why I'm so excited to be finally talking about. It's not working. Mic help. What if I just do away with the mic? Not good enough. I gotta get in here. Is this okay? Maybe I'll, maybe I'll hold it. Okay. Um, as I was saying, though, it's been such, such a long journey. And through most of it, I've heard crickets and frogs, and now I'm hearing sirens, and it's really exciting for me. Um, but it really has. It's been such a long journey in India and through the jungles, and then years of writing, and you don't know if it's going to work, if people are going to like it, if anybody's going to come. So this is really exciting. And I'm going to take you through a little bit of the, the field work I do and the jungle stuff, the side of it that created the story that became the book. Um, so, and the other thing we're going to do is we're going to hope this works. Just tell me what button to press. The center button? That one. The right side. It's very sensitive. Too. Okay, I'm being careful. Um, well, I would say... 2007 was when I was convinced to go to India and I always think it's it's fun it's a funny story because when I thought of going to India I didn't think I wanted to go I wanted to be in the Amazon I wanted to be in deep jungle there was actually not much that made me want to go to India until a professor said to me I have two words for you and he goes this is why you need to go on this study abroad he said tigers and elephants and that those two words ended up changing my life because this picture, uh, I think so many of us have in our heads the, that sort of jungle book residue. I mean, for so many of us, the only thing that taught us about the Indian jungle is jungle book, which is this seed that Kipling planted like 120 years ago. And when I learned that tigers are so close to extinction and the Asian elephants are also dwindling, I just thought it's worth it at all costs to go and learn about this. And really the last 10 years, this has become such a focus for me of following these species and learning about them. Before we get too much into them though, this is where you find species like peacock. In these jungles are spectacled cobras. We're jumping. Peacock, peacock tailed bears. Um, and then, if I can get it to go. Yeah, just go next. That. So in the Amazon, one of the major differences, people ask me, what's, what's the difference like between the Amazon and India? And in the Amazon, you have jaguars. You have large pig-like things called tapirs. But other than butterflies and lizards and snakes, there's really not a lot of giant things in the Amazon. This is, this is a guar. It's a type of bison that's seven feet at the shoulder. This animal is so big that when we've seen tigers, we've seen tiger kills where the, the head of these things is laying on the ground, so you get to see how big they are in comparison to you. And that head is about way bigger than my torso. And then it starts making you think, what could those, I mean, those things have knocked over cars. They can knock over a bus. When you're, I've been in a herd of those when they surround your car and they don't like you and they're all drooling and they're all grumbling and it's terrifying to see an animal that big. 
And the thing is, what preys on them are tigers. Now, to set up what a tiger really is, I want to tell you a story that sank in deep with me when I was learning about tigers. And it takes place, I think, about the turn of the century, about 1905. This was in a Nepalese village, and people started going missing. And at first it was unexplained, and then they started finding little bits of people in the jungle, and they realized that there was this rogue tigress, and she was carrying away people. And now, in ecology, we look at a tiger and we say, a tiger is good to eat about one deer a week. And if a tiger is going after people, that really comes out to about one and a half people a week. And so as the first year passed, the tigers had already eaten about 100 people. And this was at a time where they called in hunters, they called in, I mean, they tried to poison her, they used dogs, and nobody could get this tigress. And after the second year, when they kept trying, her body count had gone up to 200. So what they did was they surrounded the whole forest and they burnt it to the ground, assuming that she would be caught in that and that would solve their problems. What she did was she saw them coming, she crossed over into India where they had no idea what was happening, and she got hungry again. And so as this tiger started, began praying again, again, soon the body counts kept going up, and this time in an Indian village where they'd never heard of what was happening. And so again, they called in snipers. As she kept going, you actually had crops rotting in the fields because people wouldn't go outside of their houses. And as they called in snipers, um, one, of the, one of the men was standing in a field, and he actually got eyes on her for the first time. And this was like an expert marksman, and he got his gun on her. And when the tiger turned on him, the look he saw in her eyes, he dropped his gun and he ran for it. Because this guy was smart enough and experienced enough to know that if you don't get her on the first shot, she's going to come finish you off. A bear, if you shoot it, will run. A tiger, if you shoot it, if it doesn't die, it's going to come finish you off. And so in the end, what they had to do is, well, I use this also. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take a departure from that for a second for the size of the animals that we're talking about that in my head growing up, I always thought of a tiger as like the size of a large dog. And in real life, when you actually are near an adult tiger, if you look at the, the size of his neck versus the size of my neck, the size of his chest versus the size of my chest, they're so much bigger than us, so much faster than us. And their smell is better, their eyesight's better, their hearing's better. They're just on every level, they outpower us. And so the only thing, that's okay. That's okay. Um, I'll go back one slide. Just go back one. Because the way they finally got this tigress was they got 300 people together. They got a team of elephants together. They went through this forest, and they set fire, and they brought drums, and they scared every single animal to a choke point, and they put this expert hunter named Jim Corbett at the choke point. And after four years and over 400 people had been eaten, finally this tiger ran out, and he shot her, and he took, her three sh took him three shots to get her down. And when this tiger was shot down, what they noticed was that they lifted her jowls, and her canine teeth were destroyed. And it was from, from when she was very, very young. So she'd actually never had the equipment to hunt wild game, and that's why she'd had to go after something easier. We're not as strong as a deer. We're not as fast as a deer. So she just started preying on people because it was easy. And what that story to me illustrates is, first of all, the incredible power of a tiger, how cunning they are in the forest. And, and just sort of how powerful and masterful they are inside of the jungle. Now, the I believe that Blake wrote Tiger, Tiger, Burning Bright, right? Dad? <laughs> William Blake. Um, that was in, I think, the 1790s. And at that time, there's probably about 200,000 tigers in the world. This was around 1900, and at that time, there's about 100,000 tigers in the world. What followed was a period where you had almost like hunting tourism to India, where you'd go and hunt tigers. Across Asia, they were knocked out. In China, they treated them like a pest, and they actually tried to exterminate tigers. So all across Tiger Range, all across the world, you had this dwindling of tiger population. Yeah, just this guy actually put machine guns on the back of his Rolls Royce to make a tiger murdering machine. So this was, it was full-on sport, and they just figured, why not? And as all this was happening, actually the hunter who brought down that, that legendary man-eater, he became a huge conservationist because where he started as a tiger hunter, and just in the course of his life, as he got older, he started saying, I'm, these, things are, these things are vanishing. What is it? 
That's okay. He's doing a great job. We can we can make it through like this. Thank you. Um, you can go next. Yeah. So this, if you look at the yellow on the map, that's that's the original tiger range on our planet, and that's so much of the planet that's covered in tigers. And if you just go to the next slide, one back. That's what it is today, just those little spots of, of yellow that are left. And that's tiger range. That's not where there are tigers. That's where there could be tigers. That's where there's possible tiger habitat. So what they've seen, there's only about 3,000 tigers left in the modern world. So you go from 100,000 tigers down to 3,000. And so just bring us to the next one. Now, today in India, you have tigers that are entering villages because they have nowhere else to go. The few little patches of forest like you saw in that map are saturated with tigers. And if there's tigers living in a region, they're going to kick out, you know, each time a mother has a baby, after that baby gets to be a year, two years old, she's kicking her out. She has to go find her own territory. But there's not a lot of territory left. And so what you see in this photo um, is a tiger coming into a village. Now this photo, this photo, I'm introducing the first of the characters in this book. Because if you think of from the time that tigers were everywhere and the jungles were thick and lush and Kipling was writing Jungle Book, all of that depletion, all of that hunting, all of that habitat loss to the point where something like this is possible. This is a tigress named Kala, and she fell into a well in central India. And so many times when tigers fall into a well, they're beaten to death instantly. Kala fell into a well in, in a village that was curious, and they called the forest department, and the forest department came, and this is what she looked like. You can just see that savage fear in her eyes, and she's rubbed part of her forehead away. And they actually threw down nets, and they tranquilized her, and they brought her up out of the well, and they kept her for about two months as she recuperated. And they fit her with a radio collar, and when they released her, after naming her Kala, she showed us something that we never knew before. She showed us what modern day tigers do. And we were able to follow her as she went from towns and villages. And what we saw was that she would be at the edge of a field where farmers were working. There was people hanging out, there was children playing. And right over in the bushes would be a tiger laying down for the entire day. And as soon as the sun would go down, the tiger would come up. And she'd walk through these villages where people had never seen a tiger in their lives, really had no concept of what a tiger is. I mean, as a, as a species, it's almost like she's a ghost. From, a, from 100,000 tigers in 1900 to just 3,000 today spread out across 11 countries, this is something that no one even knows about or has a concept of, and it's, it's right in their backyards. And she showed us this. This is a, a, this is a true story. This is, a, this is an actual tiger. She's still out there today with her radio collar on, migrating, trying to find a place to live. And at night, she would do things like mimic the call of a dog to call in stray dogs and then they have a way of hunting them where they smack them across the head to break the neck and then they take them and they do the same thing with goats and of course if they get caught if you're caught stealing livestock from a farmer you're gonna get killed so all that this this thing this tiger lives in a state of all or nothing all the time and that i just think that that photo with her eyes that set those savage eyes just really really hit me and uh that's where Kala is. And just go to the next one. This is another tigress. Now, she's moving cubs. This one was named Avni, and she actually, she left the national park, and she was killed, and it became a huge controversy. Um, she is an example of what happens when they get caught. It's, it's, it's tigers migrating through the fragmented forests of Asia has become, to me, the most incredible, incredible story. And what I was struggling for for so long was how to bring people into that world. Um, now, when you talk about tigers and when you talk about Asian forests, uh, you can't talk about Asian forests or really forests on earth without talking about elephants. As we grew up as a species, there were something like 20, 22 different species of proboscids of elephants. And th these were all over North Africa and the Middle East and Asia. And when you think of, when you watch an elephant, when you spend time with an elephant in the jungle and you watch what they do, they're eating all day long. They're consuming seeds. And when I was a, when I was a kid, I thought of, you know, the forest is where the animals live. I never thought of it that the forest is the place that the animals have made. 
When you think of that the bees are pollinating flowers, that bats are carrying seeds, that these animals are carrying things all over the forest. The forest is a creation of the animals and none of them are as influential as the elephants. They literally built the forests that we grew up in and then that we, that we cut really as we were industrializing, as we were exploring, as the world was forming into what it is today. These were the engineers that made all that. And so as, as we've been moving through India, we've seen not only that the tigers are in severe decline, but the other thing that really hit me was the story of wild elephants. And we all know how emotional elephants are and how complex their societies are. And this, this photo is what you have because they, they're big migrators. They go from one place to another place. They know the old maps. They know, their, they know the water holes that their grandparents knew. I've seen an elephant around a pregnant woman and the, the trunk goes straight to the stomach because they know. Elephants know things, and when, the, when, we, when you see elephants, again, you notice the crowds. It's so difficult for these animals to survive in a landscape with so many people, and as more and more roads keep popping up, you have more things like this happening. Um, this is another one of the characters in the book. This was a boy that we met in South India who, this is his elephant. This was, he was, I think, he was 11 years old. He was, very, he was very young. And he was telling us his parents weren't around. This was his elephant. He rode in on top of his elephant. He was smoking a cigarette. He was giving commands to other guys. And he would tell the elephant to sit. And the elephant would sit down and he would get off. And when the elephant was ready to leave, he spent about, I'd say about a half hour scrubbing every single inch of the elephant. You know, roll over. He'd scrub underneath. He'd scrub behind the ears. And when the elephant stood up again, he gave a command. The elephant lifted up its leg, and the kid kind of jumped up, grabbed the ear, climbed back over, and rode off into the jungle. The relationship between tribal people and elephants is absolutely incredible. You can go. This is Ramachandran. Ramachandran is the tallest elephant in India. He's 11 feet tall. He's been basically in elephant jail his whole life. I think his body count is up to four cows, three trainers, and two other elephants. He's big, and he's angry, and he's scary. Um, this, is, this, is, this is one of the most powerful animals in the world. And I, I tell the story that the, everyone always asks me, you know, is it the snakes that are the most dangerous thing in the jungle? And I usually tell them that it's usually driving outside that I think is the most dangerous thing. But in the jungle, the closest I ever came was from elephants. And so what happens is we saw the picture of the elephants on the road. As you have these elephants migrating through these places, they stop off and they, they snatch bananas, they snatch whatever they can from farmers. And a single elephant can knock out $20,000 worth of banana crops in a single night. They just... They just can eat so much, and also their feet are so big that they just knock everything over. So the farmers throw fireworks at them, the farmers try to electrocute them, the farmers chase them. So the elephants learn pretty quickly that people are dangerous. And they also learn that people are small and easy to crush. And so I actually, there was one morning where I was, I was sitting having coffee, and a friend of mine said, you have to be so careful, because I said that I was out looking for elephants, and she said that a nearby coffee estate owner had been having this ongoing feud with this elephant where he'd been shooting fireworks at the elephant and the elephant had been charging him and this has been going back and forth and as soon as the guy went to sleep the elephant would be in his crops eating this was going on and on and on so the guy actually started shooting like pellet guns at the elephant well the elephant also got attacked by other people and just got to the point that he didn't want to take it anymore so the elephant waited for him and the guy actually he picked the guy up by his ankles and just whacked him against the ground and his head just went Psh. I mean, but that's you picking a fight with a two-ton survival machine, you're not going to win. The thing is, and that's, that's, that's a unique example, but people always tell the story of when the, when the animal wins because we're scared of it. But of course, day to day, most of the time, it's the elephants that lose out. I was badly chased by an elephant, and that was, that was by far the closest I ever came. That's, that's not from the elephant stepping on me or anything. That, that's just from running through the forest and getting torn apart by branches as this thing was chasing me. But in that moment, I got to see how powerful, how insanely powerful elephants are. Um, got by this close, this close. But the one of the one of the most incredible things that I've seen though is the way that these boys work with the elephants inside of the forest, inside of the tribal communities, where they still collect 
fruits and berries and things. These guys are actually honey experts. They work inside the forest and they collect hive. They, they collect the honey from the hives that are up in the top of the canopy. This guy was on the ground with his elephant and his friends were walking through the rainforest canopy barefoot with machetes in their mouth, cutting branches, throwing them down. The elephant would put them right on his back and carry them through the forest and he would just lash them down and that's what they would do all day. And that's becoming that way of life and those little pockets where you still have that really rural, old school, jungle book sort of world are becoming so hard to find. We can go two, we can go two ahead, right there. And then of course, the, the, the relationship that we've seen that these people have with their elephants that after decades and decades of working together, this, this isn't my photo, but this is just a photo of an, er an elephant on her last days when the entire community comes around to mourn the death of this elephant. And it really is a very beautiful and complex relationship between people and elephants in South India. You can go to the next one. This is just a quick slide. I'm not going to go too much into this, but one of the things that the book deals with and one of the things that I have seen in South India is the difference between tribal people living inside the forest and tribal people when they're relocated outside of the forest because the animals aren't the only thing that depend on the forest and these people are very tied to the forest and as they're getting moved out, a lot of times for corporations that come in and want the forest for mining, other times because of conservationists that want to make a tiger reserve without people in it. And then the, 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 the contrast is absolutely devastating. If we can go next. All right, now, you can just let this play. Um, of course, wherever I go, I, I'm, I'm always drawn to snakes and the stories of snakes. This was a king cobra, an 11-foot king cobra that came into a village. You can see how they say that they can stand as, and look you in the face, which I think is a little bit of an exaggeration. This cobra came into the village and everyone thought it came to kill someone. It came because it was thirsty. And I don't know if you've ever seen a snake drinking before, but that's what it looks like. And so we gave him, we gave him some water and we, we sent him on. But I'm going to leave India just for a minute. Um, because in the last few years, we've spent so much time, mostly my wife and I, also, usually in a, in a little car, like road tripping through South India, trying to find tiger tracks, trying to meet the elephant workers, trying to get footage of all this stuff. Um, and in between that, we'd spend huge amounts of time in the Amazon. And today we're protecting, I mean, how many people heard about the Amazon fires a few weeks ago? Like pretty much everybody. We're trying as hard as we can to protect as much of the Amazon. You have to protect the standing forest. You cannot, you cannot let it go and then try to repair it. This is, these are thousand year old ecosystems that have complex ecology that you're never gonna get back in our lifetime. So protecting that habitat is sort of the only way that we can really truly put out the Amazon fires. So along with running a ranger program to protect forests, and uh, we, have, we run an ecotourism company called Tamandu Expeditions, and we bring people to the jungle, and that employs local people to not be cutting down the forest, not be miners or loggers, but to be like boat drivers and cooks, and they, they get to meet people from all over the world, and they have fun, and they usually are a lot more happy with that work, and we get to protect the forest. In 2012, though, we had guests come and it was two parents and their daughters and the younger daughter her name was Isha and we're in the Amazon and this kid had such a connection to wildlife like I've never seen I've met the Mahouts in India who were with their with their elephants but this girl couldn't even stand the death of a butterfly if I killed a mosquito she would stop dead in her tracks and go how could you do that you're the animal guy you're supposed to love animals and I had to like debate this 11 year old on like, no, I get to kill mosquitoes. Like I'm protecting the jungle, I get to kill the mosquito. And she was like, no, that doesn't add up. It just didn't work in her head. And so she convinced me to be protect, like rescuing butterflies out of the kitchen and just all these crazy things. There was just this inability to take any sort of injustice, especially towards wild animals that didn't hurt anybody. And on the last day of their trip, when we were leaving, uh, we saw these poachers and they were carrying out two giant yellow-footed tortoises, probably about 70 years old each, these giant, old, ancient-looking tortoises that are very beautiful. Um, and they were headed, headed for the soup pot. And it's, it's pretty brutal when they cook a yellow-footed tortoise, but she didn't know that. But little Isha's standing there, and there's poachers over here, and she looks at me, and she goes, what are they doing with those tortoises? 
I was like, uh, they're gonna they're gonna eat him for lunch. And she just started <laughs> they just started crying. And she looked at me and she just goes, You have you have to do something about this. And of course, I'm used to working in the Amazon. I mean, I've eaten spider monkeys on a spit over a fire. I'm used to it. You have to callous yourself to a certain amount of animal suffering if you're gonna live in these places. Um but seeing her reaction to it and that of like, no, I'm not talking about on a species level. I'm talking about this animal right here. What are you going to do to stop it? And in the end, I was forced to buy the tortoises off the poachers, which was a hysterical conversation in Spanish because I was asking them to buy their tortoises. And they were like, but you don't know how to cook them. And they, they, they couldn't understand it at all. And I was like, how do I explain to you that I'm not going to cook them? Um, anyway, so that the reason I'm telling you that story is that a few years later, that same girl, Isha, I was in the Amazon about to leave on a six-week expedition, and I get an email. And the email said, I have a question about a tigress. And it's from her, and she's back home, and they were from India. And she's in South India, and she sends me this email, and she goes, you're the person that I know that actually tries to protect animals. I need to know if there's these two tiger cubs, what do I feed them? Where do I take them? What do I do if the mom doesn't come back? She had all these very logical questions about protecting baby tiger cubs and how she was gonna go save them. And that for me was the thing, that email was the thing that sort of sparked all this off. And if you can go to the next thing, it's sort of tied together all these years of all the different things that we saw. Because for me, to take people on sort of a non-fiction journey about you know, how many elephants are found in the which area and how many kilometers per night a tiger takes, to me, would leave off so much of the truth of what these animals are going through. I wanted to be able to take people into the mind of a modern day tiger, because when you're out there following them, you get, a, you get a little glimpse, you get just the slightest little glimpse into what they go through and the elephants and how, how sensitive they are and how much they know. And this, that's how the story came together. And that's what I've been trying to do by bringing you through the field work is to sort of introduce you to some of the different characters that you'll find in this book and why they're in this book. Um, I think if you go to the next one, we, as I was writing this, I tried to be as intimate as possible with the jungle. And this is when I was finishing up and you can see He's trying to get my note. I don't know what he wanted, but he wanted the notebook really, really bad. And you see, the last time I yell at him, I tell him to stop it. And he gets very upset. He puts his trunk in his mouth and walks away. That's, that's, his name is Dharma. He's a sweetheart. He's a, he's a semi-wild elephant. He was raised sort of in captivity and then set free. The problem is, when you set him free, he goes out onto the roads, and him and he has a friend, and this is elephants, man, you don't think of it, but they go out and they mug trucks. Because <laughs> in, in, in South India, there's all these trucks going around with bananas in them, and so what they do is, he's comfortable with cars, because he knows about people, so he's got like people street smart. So he goes in front of the car and he'll stand there and just be like, nope. And the truck can't go by, and then his friend comes around, reaches in, and starts hauling out bunches of bananas, and they mug the trucks. And so a few times he's ended up in elephant jail, and uh, our friend has to go pick them up. Um, that and the other thing, he's the first, he was one of the first ones. He, negotiating with him is horrible, because what he'll do is, if you smell like bananas in any capacity, he'll be like, bananas. And I'll be like, dude, Dharma, I don't have bananas on me right now. Like, please, let's let me like do it. And he'll go up to the car and he'll like, you know, just start, just start pushing the car and the car will start leaning over. And then when you hear the springs and you hear two wheels come off the ground and you, the car is only on two wheels, what option do you have? You give him the bananas and he wins that negotiation every time. And he's smart. The only thing you can do, which is really unpleasant is to like light hay on fire and chase him with it. But then if he decides to crush you, then he wins again. So this, it, it was very strange as like an adult human being in a position where I was trying to negotiate with an animal and I couldn't. I couldn't possibly win. It wasn't even like, it wasn't even close. Um, I want to play for you guys a few, a few, just give it one second. The, the, it's just a little bit of the footage that I've filmed over the years set to some music, imagining this book as a movie, just, this would be like what the trailer would look like, I think. Um, and then, uh, and then I just have a few last things to wrap up with, but enjoy. I'll get out of the way. We all knew that they would say it was just a legend, like it was one of the old stories. But this happened in our time. 
You see how past the village is. There's still magic out there. In the last scraps of jungle. Where the old ways still survive. It's the story that the animals asked me to tell. One that would have been lost if it wasn't for the memory of those of us who'd been there to see it for ourselves. They'd say a legend of stripes and fire that came to be known as the girl and the tiger. That's on the right. We have a. That's the U.S. cover, and then on the left is the cover that's coming out in India. Which I'm so excited that this book is coming out in India because it came from there and it should be there. And on top, we got Slash from Guns and Roses gave his endorsement, which is really exciting. Um, <laughs> Slash loves animals, especially snakes, and he was like, "Tigers, I love that. I can do that." Um, and and Steve Winter from National Geographic, who's their big cat expert, was was kind enough to take a look at it. And it's, it's a story that I hope is the story that the animals would want me to tell. I really feel like by walking around and seeing, seeing all these little stories and seeing what they go through and seeing their reality, that like this, this somehow is, is, you know, is a representation of that. It's my best shot as a representation of that. It's the best way I could think of to bring people into what they go through and sort of... Um, maybe update the Jungle Book a little bit. I never liked when I was a kid in the, the Jungle Book that the tiger was the bad guy. Because in my life, I always saw the tiger as this, you know, the refugee that's almost extinct. And so maybe this is like the, the follow-up, the modern day. But I don't think, you can go to just, I think just the next slide. Go one more, two more. That's just, I had to, I just like to end on this note because after, what was it, seven, seven years in India, I finally, it took me that long to see my first tiger out in the wild. And this was, we spent a long time together and at first I said, I'm not going to take a picture. And then I did, I did take one just to, just to get the shot, just to remember it because uh, it took that long and they're that hard to see. But this is, this is the story of tigers, elephants, and the jungle of South India. So I hope you like the book and thanks for coming. Thanks a lot. Sure, if you want to raise your hand, uh, I will do my best to bring you a mic and we can do a couple of questions. Bonus points for going first. <laughs> he's, he's got a good voice. <laughs> Hello, Paul. Hey, Vinny, what's happening, man? <laughs> I, I read in the first moments of your book that elephants are right or left tusked or... Or um, yeah, like we're righties and lefties. They were like is that right. true? Yeah, absolutely. See, in the midst of this beautiful story, there's so much knowledge. It's amazing. Thank you, Paul. Thank you, man. <laughs> Any other questions? <laughs> we don't. So you mentioned that some of the tribal people have like their elephants. Mm -hmm. Can you explain the relationship between like? how domesticated versus is it is it like mean domestication or is it okay because they're sort of wild at the same time like what's that relationship like that is that's worthy of its own book okay because <laughs> i find that when you're out there and you see how they work with the elephants that 
it really is on a person to person basis because some of the people are very, very loving to their elephants and they have a very good relationship with them. And then there's some that are like abusive, like it's almost like a abusive marriage. Like it's just like the, I've, there was one where the, the Mahout was an alcoholic and he was beating the elephant and he was always drunk. And then finally the elephant killed him because it had been beaten for five years. And it was like, you know, this, it was just this, but it's such an intense relationship, but if done right, um, it can, it can be okay. It can be okay. And because they're living in their jungle and they're around other elephants and there's all of that to go with it. It's not like they're in like a, you know, it's not like the elephants you see like in like a French circus or, or when we used to have elephants in New York city. Um, so complicated is my answer in one word. Yeah. <laughs> hey, Paul. What's up, man? Um, how do I voice this? Um, when and how often? How often did you notice a change of heart from killing and fear? to conservation and what was the breaking point if there ever was one for who throughout your for the for people for locals oh i just think as soon as they get as soon as you take someone's someone's own survival out of it they become they have lots more time to be compassionate yeah. so i mean we just even in the amazon i just uh last year we went to a, a, a gold miners camp and he was cutting down the forest, letting it burn, you're sucking the, the gold comes in particles in the Amazon in the sand. So they have to pump the sand through like this huge machine and then use mercury to bind it out. It just completely destroys the forest and then pollutes the land. And we went up to this guy and we were like, hey man, do you want tourists? And he was like, yeah, how much does that pay? And we told him and he was just like, yeah, it sounds great. I'll pack up the gold stuff. Yeah. And I was like, yo, you see that monkey that you just shot? I was like, keep the baby and like make her healthy. And I was like, people would love that, like to see that. And I was like, let her climb and see if she'll go back. And he was like, Okay, but it was just like overnight. He was like, yeah, no, he's like, I don't want to do any of this. He's like, I think this is a beautiful patch of forest. Like it took him that long. He was just like, no, nah, I really just don't have another way of making a living. And in Africa, we've seen so much of the same thing where you're like, hey, elephant poacher. And they're like, yeah, do you want to get paid more to shoot the guys that are shooting the elephants? And they're like, yeah, <laughs> like that's a great idea. <laughs> like it's just, it's, re it's really quick. Um, and I think that that can be applied to so many things in conservation so quickly. You have maybe one more question. Oh, man. So with the increased urbanization just of India and the increase in kind of just the amount of population, yeah. um, what are the kind of the the initiatives that are going on in India to help the tigers, the elephants, like do they have a shot? Or is it just something right now where just the kind of the momentum is just so far against them that it's really kind of that that last last chance we have? I think that the problem is that in India they do have a shot because in India it's become like there's so much national pride for the tiger as a species, as well as for elephants, as well as there's so many people that are so awake to the idea that ecosystems provide our clean water. In India, you see that they'll cut down a forest and then the people downriver no longer have irrigation for their crops. So they've seen this again and again and again. They, they are very well trained in how destroying an ecosystem ruins the lives of people downstream or, you know, or, or comparable examples of that. For tigers, though, they're spread out across 11 countries. So in India, you actually have the tiger population rising because they're trying to make connected national parks. And what they figured out was, as long as you have forest areas that have plenty of deer, so actually the key to protecting tigers is just make sure the locals aren't hunting the deer. Because in a lot of places, the deer were wiped out and then all the tigers vanished. But as long as you just have hundreds and hundreds of deer standing around a forest, the tigers will figure the rest out. They've been surviving for thousands and thousands of years. Um, so they have a shot in India. The problem is that throughout the rest of Asia where there isn't such a, I mean, India is a pretty developed, pretty organized country at this point compared to a lot of, a lot of other countries in Southeast Asia. Um, so it's, it's, it's complicated, but they certainly have a shot there, if not the rest of the places. I mean, as well with the elephants. And I think that more and more, uh, like people are, people are blocking off like new road projects. People are standing in the way of, because so many times we've had like 
a classic example was that Pepsi wanted to open a, a factory in India, and they opened a factory right on this river, which you'd say, who allowed them to do this? They opened the fact they put the river the factory right on the river, so the river had to like flow through the factory, and when it came out the other side, the water was so bad that the goats wouldn't drink it. And if goats won't drink it, man, it's bad. And what happened was thousands and thousands and thousands of people got sick or died or had to be displaced because they could no longer make a living from that river. There was no longer fish in that river. And we see this again and again and again, where a few guys get rich, everybody else gets poor. And we keep letting it happen. But in India, they've had so much of this that it's almost turning into where they're like, well, we know what's going to happen, so we're going to stop it. And one of the best examples of that that I heard was that in Kerala, in the south, the local fishermen they saw all the big trawlers coming in and we've seen this in Africa where the big trawlers come in they completely destroy the, the ecosystem and then all of a sudden there's millions of fishermen that have nothing to do because there's no fish literally no fish left in the ocean and in Kerala they, they were smart to this they were just like no they got together they organized Indians are very good at organizing that's something that we could learn from them they organized and they pushed out the trailers the trawlers and now they only use their traditional methods of fishing which they're just investing in their futures by just continuing to do what they've always done. And it's like, they just, they just said, no, they just said it stops here. We're not going to let that happen. And they did it. So with wildlife, I, I, it's, it's happening little by little. Look, we have humpback whales coming back to New York waters that used to be polluted like 30 years ago. You wouldn't see a humpback here. So it's like this stuff can get better, but right now, especially for tigers, we're just at that point where it's like, it's either going to go out completely or it's going to get better. And that's why I think that, talking about this as much as possible and getting this story into the minds of people, especially young people, um, in a different way than, than I guess the traditional of just like, you know, just like a, a nature documentary or something. I guess that's what, that's what, you know, this is all about. Thank you all for your questions. And before you have one more. All right. What is next? I can't tell you that yet. <laughs> I don't know myself. <laughs> Oh no 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 that's it. Um, I've I've I have my I have my studies and that's what now I no I'm serious. We're trying to we're actually the publisher and and myself we we decided that uh, a dollar off of every book for the first ten thousand books is actually going to go towards starting like a way station like a tiger reserve in between reserves so like a like a rest stop where they can stop and like nail a quick deer and just like drink you know just quick murder of deer and then move on but somewhere that they can be safe and we're trying to find partners to match on that and we're just trying to do that whereas in the Amazon we're trying to use tourism and we're trying to use donations to protect forests I try to make it so that every project has real meaningful consequences on the ground so I'm not going to keep just going to different places because pretty soon I'll be stretched too thin and my head will explode it'll be horrible Uh, Cy no, 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 no. Cold. I don't do cold. Um, <laughs> some, some, somebody else can worry about Siberian tigers. Um, all right. Before, be, last thing in closing, next week on the 25th, 25th, with all this stuff that's been going on, it's climate week. We've had the Amazon fires, the girl and the tiger. We're having the Rainforest Summit in Brooklyn at the Wyatt Hotel. And it's on the 25th. You can get tickets at the rainforestsummit.com. And... I'll be talking there, and I'm going to be screaming at people to protect the planet, so it's going to get ugly. You're invited to come watch. <laughs> Thank you, guys. Thank you so much, Paul.